Hello, and welcome to the Movie Universe. I'm your host, Movie Fan. Today, I will be talking about one of the greatest war movies ever made, the legendary Tora Tora Tora. I've been wanting to cover this film for a long time, because in the words of my brother, Rising Hawk, this movie is a masterpiece. And since me and Bonnie talked about Pearl Harbor, I got spurred to finally cover this film. You heard about the worst, now you're going to hear about the best. The story is really quite simple, because it's actually about the days and months that led up to the attack on Pearl Harbor. And this is one of the few films that covers both sides of the spectrum. As I said during the Pearl Harbor review, there are not too many films that have done this. This is one of them. And this does a better job. For most of the film, you see the Japanese planning to attack Pearl, and you see the Americans who were basically thinking that we got nothing to worry about, except for a select few. There are a few officers and members of Congress who think that the Japanese are going to attack us. And of course, they were right. The Japanese were getting ready to attack. But so many White House officials and top-ranking officers didn't think that the Japanese had the gall to attack us. But there were some men in Army intelligence who believed that the Japanese were going to attack us. But they don't know when, and they don't exactly know where. Many of them theorized Pearl, but many of them had the dates wrong. Like there was one officer from intelligence who believed it was going to be November the 30th. Meanwhile, you see the Japanese officers talking about what their attacks are going to be. And you're also seeing the Japanese pilots getting geared up. You see them learning the ships that they're going to bomb. And you even hear from the high-ranking officers that Emperor Hirohito planned to do this by the book. We're talking by the Geneva Convention here. His plan was to deliver a declaration of war to the White House just maybe a couple minutes before the attack, if not right on the exact second. However, there was a very big glitch in that part of the plan, and I'll get into that later. But in the meantime, we're still seeing the Japanese side. They're talking about what they plan to do. We hear how Admiral Yamamoto plans to make this a very decisive strike that would cripple the U.S. Navy. Because our carriers are supposed to be there. However, there are a few cautious admirals, mostly Admiral Bull Halsey, who believes that there will be an attack on the horizon, and he decides to take the carriers out, because he has no idea where the Japanese plan to strike. And at the same time in Washington, intelligence officers are trying to do everything they can to convince the higher-ranking officers that there will be an attack on Pearl Harbor. Because every message they keep decoding keeps dropping hints that there's going to be an attack. And then there's the part of the story where they find out that the Japanese fleet had disappeared. But, of course, everyone in the White House is not taking this seriously. They just think that there's nothing to worry about. And then on December 7th, the Japanese make their attack. They come flying in over the island, and they're actually picked up on radar. The sergeant in charge says, don't worry about it, because he thought that was a group of B-17s that were coming in from the mainland. And he was right about that. There was a group of B-17s coming in. But that wasn't them. And roughly at the same time, the USS Ward sees a Japanese midget submarine trying to sneak into the harbor. They shoot around right through the sail, and they hit it with depth charges. The captain of the ward immediately sends a message that they just sunk a submarine. But the man in charge doesn't believe him, and he says he wants confirmation. In other words, he completely ignored them. And in no time flat, the Japanese pilots are right at Pearl Harbor. They're bombing and torpedoing the battleships. They're hitting nearby bases with everything they got. And they're even attacking the B-17s that are coming in. The damage is absolutely devastating beyond belief. You see B-17s getting shot down. You see the battleships go up in smoke. And you see very few Japanese Zeros get shot down. There is one big scene that comes up where you see two young pilots named George Welsh and Kenneth Taylor go to a small airport hop into a couple of P-40s, and they take on the Japanese Zeros. That moment is by far one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. The aerial combat, it, it was a work of art. The way those P-40s were flying, outmaneuvering the Zeros, and not to mention the fact that they shot down six of them, which is a very big deal. Because don't forget, they were up against the entire Japanese Imperial Naval Air Force up there. Meanwhile, back in Washington, we come back to that little glitch I mentioned. What happened was the Japanese ambassador had a typist try to type up the declaration of war. 
But it was pretty obvious the man had no idea what he was doing. Because by the time he had finished typing up that declaration, it was almost a full hour after they started bombing Pearl. 55 minutes to be exact. And when they deliver it to the Secretary of State, he says this, quote unquote, In all my years in this office, I have never come across anything like this before. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what he meant by that. And you could see it right on his face that he was greatly insulted by this. It was just that whole, they have the nerve to attack us and then declare war on us an hour later. He was so appalled by it, he just told them to get out. To which they leave, and at the same time we're seeing the Japanese still bombing Pearl. And for the record, in this movie they do not attack hospitals, just the bases and Battleship Row. And after the Japanese have struck, they leave. As you may have guessed, the Japanese Imperial Fleet is celebrating at this great victory that they have achieved. However, Admiral Yamamoto is not celebrating. And he gives a very serious speech. To put it quite simply, he says that he hoped to achieve a decisive victory against our fleet. But the carriers were not there. So we are still a threat to them. And to make matters worse, the declaration of war did not go to the White House until 55 minutes later. And he says that that's going to infuriate the Americans even more. And then he says this, I fear that we have awakened a sleeping giant and filled him with resolve. Then Admiral Yamamoto walks off, goes to the top deck, and you hear in a voiceover him saying those exact words, I fear that we have awakened a sleeping giant and filled him with resolve. And that's where the movie ends. It is truly a masterpiece, one of the greatest war movies ever made. Because unlike Pearl Harbor, this movie is incredibly accurate. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it's 99% accurate. Which is way more than I could say for the movie Pearl Harbor. But yes, it is 99% accurate. There's a little embellishment here because, well, you know, that's Hollywood for you. They're going to take an artistic license. But to be fair, there were quite a few moments that were a little inaccurate because they really didn't know for sure. For instance, the scene where the USS Ward shoots that midget submarine. That did happen, and they did throw depth charges over the side. But what they didn't know at that time was... That submarine was sunk by that round alone. In the movie, they put it down that, oh, they damaged her badly when they hit the sail, but the depth charges finished her off. Again, to be fair, they didn't find that submarine until recently, so they had no way of knowing that it wasn't the depth charges that finished that submarine. It was that one shot right through the sail that did. And there is one thing I do need to clear up. When I reviewed the movie Pearl Harbor with Bonnie, I said that they did not really do a scene talking about Doris Miller shooting at the Japanese Zeros. Well, I was wrong. In this movie, they do have Doris Miller shooting at those Japanese Zeros. But in my defense, I hadn't seen this movie in over 20 years. And even I can't remember everything. Plus, it happened so quick, you don't really know who that man is. You just see him shooting at the planes. That's it. The build-up towards the bombing of Pearl Harbor is probably one of the most accurate parts in the movie. Because nobody believed that the Japanese would have the nerve to attack us. And this movie highlights that in a very big way. But one of the best things about this is when you see the Japanese plan their attack and carry it out. There is a ton going on here. For instance, there's quite a few scenes where they're sailing in the middle of a storm so we wouldn't see them coming. That really did happen. And when Admiral Yamamoto says that he fears that they have awoken a sleeping giant and filled him with resolve, he really did say that. And come to think of it, this film was pretty much a milestone for foreign films because in this movie, the Japanese are speaking their native language and you're reading what they're saying in subtitles. Now granted, subtitles are nothing new. Even back then they had them. But for most films, they usually did the bad English dubbing. But in this movie, they had the Japanese actors speak Japanese. And that's a real great thing too. Because even though I prefer dubbing or having actors who speak English do it, for moments like this, it's kind of insulting to force them to do that. Because don't forget, in their own native land, they're not speaking English. They're speaking Japanese. And like I said earlier, the aerial combat with George Welsh and Kenneth Taylor fighting off the Japanese Zeros, that was a work of art. Absolutely beautiful. 
And here's an interesting piece of information for you. When they made this movie, they actually talked to Kenneth Taylor himself. So he actually helped them with this scene. How awesome is that? Now, I know you're probably going to ask me, why is it called Tora, Tora, Tora? Well, it's actually called that because that was the code word that they used to signal to the fleet that complete surprise has been attained. To put it quite simply, they've achieved the element of surprise. And there is no denying that. They really did achieve the element of surprise. And that's why the movie's called Tora, Tora, Tora. If there was credit to be given in this movie, I would have to give it to everyone because the actors and actresses, they play their parts beautifully. You can actually sense the arrogance from the officers who believe that we're never going to get attacked to seeing the Japanese officers who are planning everything from the finest detail and to the men who are being attacked at Pearl. The special effects are perfect. Everything just looks so real. The explosions, the planes, the battleships, everything looks 100% real. But there are four people who deserve more credit than even the actors themselves. And that would be the producers and the directors. Because they went to the extreme length to be as accurate as possible. Because unlike Michael Bay and Jerry Brockheimer, they felt that accuracy and a history lesson was extremely important to the making of this film. And if you're wondering who these directors and producers are, the producers were Elmo Williams and Richard Fleischer. Now, Richard Fleischer actually has a pretty interesting part in this, because not only did he produce this movie, he also directed it. And unlike Michael Bay, he tried to be accurate. But it wasn't just Richard Fleischer who directed it, because they had two other directors, Toshio Masuda and Kinji Fukusaku. And I can tell you this, these three worked so perfectly together because this movie is the most accurate recreation of the attack on Pearl Harbor that I have ever seen. If you haven't seen this movie, you really should. It is a masterpiece. However, I will give you a little fair warning. There is a ton of dialogue here, and it's because of that that Roger Ebert labeled this as the most dullest movie ever made. But let's get real, folks. Just because Roger Ebert didn't like it doesn't mean you won't. And besides, a lot of dialogue is a hell of a lot better than a pointless love triangle. If you want to know how long this movie is, the full-length feature is 2 hours and 25 minutes. Like I said before, if you haven't seen this movie, you really need to look this one up. It is a masterpiece. So if you ever get the time, check it out. Believe me, you will not be disappointed. This is Movie Fan, signing off.